Okay. Well, hello everybody and welcome back. Uh, again, I am uh, Command Sergeant Major John Wayne Troxell, the third senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And uh, I'm excited to be here as we talk about this transition that's gonna happen on Friday where I will start my transition and move off and uh, see Act 4, uh, my good buddy to my left here, Chief Master Sergeant Ray Colon Lopez, will take over as the SEAC. So uh, thank you all for being here. I want to start by personally thanking you for the important work you do as journalists to inform the American public of how the men and women of our all-volunteer force, home and abroad, support our national security interests and defend our homeland and our way of life. Your role as journalist is critical to our democracy and your work builds trust and accountability for us as an institution. So as I prepare uh, my transition to retire on December 13th after 37 years, 10 months, and 29 days, but who's counting, right? It's been an honor of a lifetime to serve my country and serve as a member of a warrior class that continues to inspire and motivate me every single day. Over the past four years as the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman, I've had the privilege to travel to over 59 locations globally with several repeat offenders like Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, and places like that, and hear directly from our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen, and National Guardsmen who are at the tip of the spear defending our national security interests, supporting our allies and partners, and getting after the mission at hand. I've also had the opportunity to connect with our wounded warriors and military families, including our Gold Star families. Their strength and resilience is an inspiration. And it's been an absolute privilege to advise both General Joe Dunford and for a short time now General Mark Milley over my tenure as the SEAC. I depart here knowing that the future of our joint force is in great hands and that is due in large part to our incredible non-commissioned officers and petty officers who are the backbone of the United States military and represent our greatest competitive advantage. As I mentioned, I also brought with me a good friend and colleague, a warrior who I consider to be a lot more talented and savvier than me, Chief Mass Sergeant Ramon Colon Lopez, who, as I mentioned, will succeed me as the SEAC this Friday. I'm excited to see him take this position to new heights and felt it was important to have him here and afford him an opportunity to speak with you as well. You know, the SEAC role is relatively new. It was established in 2005 by then Chairman Pete Pace, but did not have a unique insignia to differentiate it from other senior enlisted advisor positions. I'm excited to announce the establishment of a unique insignia for the position of senior enlisted advisor to the chairman, which I'm wearing today. And Chief Lopez will be wearing this Friday for our change of responsibility ceremony. Similar to the unique rank worn by service senior enlisted advisor colleagues in the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, this new insignia represents an important step in differentiating the unique roles and responsibilities of this joint position on the joint staff and in the Department of Defense. The design and development of the insignia was a collaborative effort across the services and Institute of Heraldry, and I wanted to share this historical mind, milestone with you. So thanks again for coming, and uh, I'll ask uh, my good buddy CZ, as he is known, uh, to kind of give any opening comments you like, and then we'll be uh, more than happy to take your questions. CZ? Uh, first of all, it's uh, great to see uh, some familiar faces here, but uh, the only thing I have to add is that it is an absolute honor to uh, follow that, that, you know, uh, Command Sergeant Major John Wayne Troxell has done for this nation. Thanks, brother. Okay, what are your questions? Yes, go ahead, Carl. Thank you, sir. Yeah. First of all, I want to say thank you for your service. And oh, thank you. Best of luck in retirement, and thank you um, for doing this. I, um, we really appreciate getting to talk to you uh, one last time, and also to you, congratulations, and we look forward to working with you in your capacity. That said, I have a question because today we just learned about these Afghanistan papers, and we learned in these that government officials were saying that they routinely touted statistics they knew were distorted, they knew were false. Senior enlisted leaders, it's the enlisted that was going to Afghanistan as well as the officers. They were dying in Afghanistan. 
So, sir, as you're leaving, can you give me your opinion learning now that so much of this was distorted to the public? And, Chief, if you want to weigh in as well, I'd appreciate it. So what you're talking about, he and I have been in, in a conference all day, so I haven't seen if anything has come out about this now. But I will say this about uh, um, our actions over the last 18 years in Afghanistan. You know, when you look at the country of Afghanistan, and up until the 1970s where a monarch monarchy ruled, and ever since then, especially in 1979 uh, when the Soviets moved in, you know, it was a country in disarray, and it was a country that was constantly at war. And then with the rise of the Taliban and uh, some of their harsh treatment of Afghan citizens, uh, and then with the 9-11 attacks and us coming in, um, it has been baby steps as we move forward to assist the Afghan uh, military to assist in securing the Afghan nation. And it's going to be step by step how we get after business. I will tell you that the chairman and I were just in Afghanistan on Thanksgiving Day, and what I saw over there in terms of our support to the Afghan forces as well as our support to the Afghan government, is we are still continuing to get after business and assist the Afghans to better see themselves, to have efficient processes in place to not only uh, build capability, uh, but to sustain it and, and also to build on their personnel and sustain the personnel in their armed forces. Anything you'd like to add? No, and uh, like uh, CSM Troxel just stated, we have been in a conference all day, so I'm not privy to all the details of what you're looking for, Carla. But the one thing that I will tell you is that I was there in the early days uh, training what has become known as the Afghan Special Forces. And if you look at our construct right now and our rank and file, and that particular specialty has taken us decades to get to where we are. So we cannot expect overnight successes. Um, not privy to the numbers or anything else, but I will tell you that the men and women that have, go have been going back since 2002 to perform this mission have been pouring their heart and soul into us so that they have an exit strategy. Well, thank you. And just to follow up, one of the things that General Flynn had pointed out was that progress being made was what was touted by government officials and military officials, but it felt like on the ground the United States was losing. So I guess my follow would be, do you do you or did you ever feel like you were being lied to on the progress of this war? Absolutely not. I served as the, the operational headquarters command senior enlisted leader, the ISAF Joint Command senior enlisted leader in 2011 and 12. And uh, I firmly thought the strategy we had in place was, was working. And as we continued to build capacity and we continued at that time, eight, nine years ago, uh, build this partnership with the Afghans. I thought we were going in the right direction. And I've been to Afghanistan 10 times in the last four years in this job. And I feel that we've never been lied to and we are continuing to move forward. You have to understand, when you're building alliances, especially with a nation that's been in disarray with Afghanistan, that there's a lot of stuff that we cannot take for granted at the basic level in terms of uh, how you build a force, how disciplined that force is. Eight years ago, the average uh, reading age of the Afghan service member was first grade reading level. Uh, when you look back in 2002 when CZ first got there, you know, the uh, illiterate population on females was significantly high. So getting the, to move in the right direction, as he said, it's one step at a time and it's continuing to build day after day after day. I will tell you, Carla, that every time setting a foot off the ramp of a Chinook, a 60, or a ground vehicle, never once did I question the orders of my superiors in any kill or capture mission. I did trust my peers, I did trust our partners, and uh, we were there with a purpose. And up to today, where we are from 2002, I will tell you that uh, there's a lot more safety and security because of the actions taken not only by myself personally, but my peers in that community. Okay, who else? Okay, Megan, we'll go to you and then to you, sir. All right, one more tough question, then hopefully we can move on to happier things. So you spent several months of this year uh, relieved of this position and under investigation. You were cleared, you came back to work. 
Uh, are you willing to open up at all about what went on during that investigation, what the nature of it was, and uh, what it was like coming back and moving forward after all of that? So um, I will tell you that, uh, you know, I was suspended and was investigated, and uh, the investigation was done correctly, and uh, General Dunford looked at the results of the investigation, and he chose to reinstate me. The particulars of, of that, I don't... Uh, want to discuss in this forum, but I will tell you what I've learned is, um, you know, self-reflection is important, especially as a senior enlisted leader. And as something like this happens to you, you have to look internally at yourself and say, did I, did I let myself down? Did I let the position down? Or did I let the institution, the greater institution down? And, and then uh, certainly when General Dunford uh, reinstated me, I had to look and say, how do I make sure that I don't, something like this doesn't happen again? And how do I continue to regain the trust as I go out and, and about and do my duties? So it was significantly a trying time. But I felt um, throughout the whole process, certainly in this forum right here, I had the support because I had built relationships, uh, not only across the joint force, but with institutions like the media and everything. I thought. Um, it was because of that that when I came back in, I was welcomed back in. And certainly what helped is uh, uh, having guys like this stop by and see me, uh, you know, whenever he was in town to, to show their support. And, uh, you know, when something like this happens to you, you truly know who the people are that you can trust. And uh, I will tell you that uh, when that happened to me, the, just the numbers – of colleagues and the numbers of others across the DOD that were either calling or emailing or, and I'm talking combatant commanders, service chiefs, the entire DSELC uh, and folks, uh, you know, Gold Star family members and everything, just sending out their support uh, just meant a whole lot to me. And, and that, I, that uh, General Dunford had the faith and confidence in me to put me back uh, just reinforce that I, I need to get out and continue to get after the mission. Do you have any advice for other senior leaders who've been in a similar position or who are in one right now? Um, be cognizant of your environment at all times. Um, as the SEAC, and, and you'll see as, uh, as uh, CZ takes over the position, when you serve as the senior enlisted advisor to the principal military advisor to the president and secretary of defense, uh, and your job is to gain the pulse of the force for the chairman, that suggests that you're out with the troops. And as I mentioned in the opening statement, you know, I've visited 59 different air operational areas and certainly places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Turkey, Somalia, places like that are the Korean Peninsula, are places that you continue to go back. And so you can get so focused on the operational environment and providing that pulse that you forget about... Uh, you know, being back here in the Pentagon and, and what your role is back here. So um, uh, my advice to any senior enlisted leader out there is, yes, you have a primary mission to get out and be with the troops and, and, and uh, make sure that uh, you're providing, you know, what they're doing, how they're doing it, what conditions they're doing it under back to your boss. But you got to make sure that uh, you are cognizant uh, of all of your surroundings and that uh, – you know what's going on around you uh, back in your headquarters as well. Okay. Did you have one? Yeah. Then, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Corey Dickstein with Stripes. I'm going to go a totally different direction here. <coughs> um, the, the new insignia, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, – I'm struggling to see it from here. I apologize. But can you tell us a little bit about what's on there and what kind of – a, what you know led you guys to going down that road as nobody sure. has done so, before? Uh, um, when I came into this job, uh, you know, General Dunford said, hey, you have to give this job irreversible momentum. Because if you remember, there was a time, a lapse between 2008 and 2011 where there wasn't a SEAC. And he said, hey, you, you've got to give this thing irreversible momentum. So as I continued to move out, in the first two years here and doing things to build trust, not only uh, 
with my bosses, but with the Defense Senior Enlisted Leader Conference, the Combatant Command Senior Enlisted, and the Service Senior Enlisted. It was about two years ago we felt the time was appropriate to come up and look at a distinctive rank insignia. So we started looking uh, at different options, and we came up with three options, and each of the services uh, uh, agreed on a certain course of action. And uh, we put that course of action, after a lot of research and a lot of development, we put those courses of actions in front of Chairman Milley, and Chairman Milley uh, decided on this right here. What this represents, and, and you'll see on Friday with uh, SEAC-4 when he's wearing his, the eagle in the middle represents the Joint Staff Eagle, okay? As the SEAC, you're, you're not just a senior enlisted advisor of the chairman, you're, you are uh, the, uh, a member of the Joint Staff. And also the four stars, initially we were going to go with two stars, but uh, Chairman Milley was uh, the four stars representing that this, this senior enlisted leader works for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So that's how we agreed upon this design here. And obviously because each of the services have different ranks, there are slight variations of it. But in the end, the bottom line, uh, they all have the same uh, significance and symbolism. Uh, a quick follow-up. Would you be willing to hang out for a second so a couple of us can get a photo of it to, Absolutely. Uh, to publish yes. afterwards? Uh, and then uh, not a lot of people have done the SEAC job, obviously. Uh, what advice uniquely to this role you know, that you're willing to talk about have you given your successor here? So this guy, he just spent the last three years as a combatant command senior enlisted leader in one of, the, one of the most contested combatant commands, and people forget about U.S. Africa Command. And Carla, you've certainly sat down and talked to him in the past. So he is well-versed on how to operate at the strategic level. And I think uh, the advice he and I continue to talk about is uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, you know, you're, you're in here for two years with an extension for two more years. Uh, and... You, you, when, you, when you become the SEAC, and this is, I'm speaking on my experiences, you know, you look at the globe and say, well, this is the operating environment for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So if, I'm, if i got to gain the pulse for him, i got to make sure I get out and about. Now, there's 196 countries in the world, and you ain't going to get to, and I certainly didn't get to 196 of them in four years. I got to 59 different operational areas and, and countries. But... Um, you know, you have to make sure that uh, we still execute the same things that we would at the operational and tactical level, and that's what I call fighter management, that, you know, we are giving ourselves time to make sure that, you know, we have time with our families and we have time to continue to do the things that are the foundations like PT and sleep and eating right and all of these other things. Now, this guy is one of the most physically fit guys I've ever been around, and, and I know he's going to be able to get after it. But, you know, four years is a long time to be doing the same job, and you have to continue to make sure that uh, you stay excited about it. And what kept me excited was being out with the troops. And wherever I was at, whether it was talking to a small detachment on Wake Island that was doing great things or a bunch of uh, special operators in Libya or Yemen or something like that, it just kind of energized me every time I was out and about with them. So uh, I'm confident that uh, CZ is going to take this job to places that I never could take. And uh, like I said, he's, a, he's smarter and savvier than me, so I'm excited uh, to support his efforts in any way he feels that I can uh, as he moves forward. What are your thoughts on taking the job, brother? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think uh, I think you pretty much laid it out uh, very well based on the experience of the past three years and what we and the fellow combatant commands uh, have done when it comes to building global we partnerships. We got these little, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, you know, one thing that uh, John Wayne has done really well is uh, he has built many bridges when it comes to uh, other countries creating the position of a SEAC equivalent. I worked with that in Africa, and uh, here pretty soon I can almost guarantee you that you're going to get to see an international SEAC conference 
coming here to better understand the needs and capabilities of our partners in order to go ahead and uh, increase our footprint out in the globe. Yeah, so based on the work, collective work the Defense Senior Enlisted Leader Conference has done with our international partners, over the past four years, 27 countries have instituted a position of a Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chief of Defense. And probably the most notable one has been the United Kingdom. That uh, a year ago, uh, General Sir Nick Carter, uh, when he was appointed as the uh, Chief of Defense Staff, he appointed uh, uh, SEAC Glenn Houghton as the first ever UK SEAC. So that's, that's something that we're pretty proud about. Uh, certainly CZ's work in Africa with those nations seeing themselves has been important. But across the globe, I think that's what we're most important about. Um, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was going to ask about the insignia, but I also would like to ask about uh, you, came, you got into the job it had been vacant, and so, you know, you, you had to sort of create your own roadmap. No, I didn't. Uh, I replaced Sergeant Major Brian Battaglia, uh, the well, second scene. When you came into the job, uh, you had in your mind what it was going to be about, and now that you're leaving, uh, what pleasant surprises can you report to us? Um, so, uh, Sergeant Major Battaglia set me up for success very well, and uh, what he educated me on and coached me on is exactly the way the position kind of played out. But I, I just, uh, what, I, what I was pleasantly surprised about is that I was able to go to places and see our troops doing wonderful things, or I could get into a place where there might be some contentious issues going on like you know troops operating in an environment where they didn't have requisite resources like joint fires or isr or or you know personal recovery or something like that and i could report that back to my leadership and and it made an impact and so i think uh um what i best appreciated was uh being able to advise uh, the senior military officer in the Department of Defense on issues that affected the troops, either operationally or institutionally. And, uh, and I walk away with no regrets at all. Even with the, the six months that we talked about, uh, I am absolutely uh, excited that for the last four years, I got to go to places that I never thought I would be able to go. I got to do things with service members that I never thought I'd be able to do. And I got to... Uh, see um, why the United States is the partner of choice around the world, and that's because of our uh, empowered non-commissioned officer and petty officer corps, and that's what I'm most proud of as I walk away. Without mentioning uh, any locations, uh, how many of those would you, are you glad you don't have to go back to? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. So all of us have served in Iraq and Afghanistan and at certain levels. And, you know, my first combat deployment was the combat jump into Panama in 1989, 30 years ago. And then I served in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. But I think any warrior that serves in this warrior class, and they know they're going to one of these dangerous places, like Iraq or Afghanistan or someplace like that, there's a certain level of mental and emotional crossover into you may not come back from this. Now, don't get me wrong. Everybody wants to go to combat and return to their family. Don't get me wrong. But I think you mentally and emotionally prepare yourself that the enemy gets a vote, whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, wherever it's at, and that you may not come back. And so you prepare yourself mentally and emotionally for that. And in some ways, that propels you into doing things that where you see these acts of bravery across the battlefield. And this recent trip, uh, that the chairman and I did seven countries in six days, and I finished off at Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, the, you know, every time I go to Iraq and Afghanistan in this job, it, it was never to go and fight. It was to go to check on the troops and everything. So uh, as I got ready to leave and come back, I said, there was no mental and emotional crossover. And when I leave, I leave with complete peace of mind that uh, the work we're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan is important and the troops are getting after it, but more importantly, that I don't need to go back after this because my time is done and it's time to give it over to 
my replacement who will certainly get back to those areas and do the kinds of things that uh, the SEAC is uh, expected to do. So th to answer your question, I am not upset that I will never have to go back, but I think all of us that serve, and even as I retire, still live by a mentality that if he calls me and says, I need you on a troop transport to Iraq or Afghanistan to do whatever, the mindset that I would have is that I'll be on the first thing smoking to go over there. Now, I'm hoping he never calls me and tells me to do that, you know, because uh, um, my time is up and it's time for me to go enjoy my my wife, my kids, and grandkids. Because so, certainly any any of us that serve in this institution for, our, for decades uh, can are, are never the best spouses, fathers, or grandfathers that we could be if we had an ordinary nine-to-five job. So my focus is, when I leave, is to focus on my family and give back to them that have sacrificed so much that I could continue to serve as a member of this warrior class for almost four decades. Anybody else? Ryan, what's on your mind? Uh, a couple things, Sir Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, uh, one question, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about potential impacts on good order and discipline, <coughs> a series of high-profile pardon, pardons and commutations. Good order and discipline is typically the remit of the senior enlisted and the NCOs. So have you felt any impacts on that, or do you anticipate any impacts on that, or any steps being taken to mitigate any potential impacts? So, uh, you know, the pardons are a done deal. Uh, we are moving beyond that. The commander-in-chief made a decision. And we follow the orders of our superiors. And so we're moving out. I will tell you that good order and discipline is essential to everything we do. And as you mentioned, we're responsible for that in our organizations. As I travel around the force, I don't see this making an impact. Um, people may have an opinion about it, but that's their opinion. It, but the bottom line is... Um, we as the senior enlisted leader have to, leaders have to make sure that we uh, get beyond this kind of stuff and we continue to set the example, a personal example, through our actions and what we say to make sure that we're continuing to instill good order and discipline, more importantly, instill in a sense of, of, of being part of a team and, and continuing to move forward here. So uh, we have faith in the military justice process and, and we'll continue to abide by it. And, and in the end, we, as the, as the senior enlisted and the enlisted throughout all ranks, will continue to make sure we get after the discipline of our force uh, as we move forward, but more importantly, that we have a good balance between discipline and compassion. CZ, would you like to comment? Yeah, I believe that from our charge and our roles and responsibilities, the key thing is prevention. Let's not have anyone that needs to get pardoned. How about we just make sure that we keep the troops in line and that they do what they're supposed to do ethically, ethically, morally, and in accordance with the orders placed upon them. So that is really where I'm going to focus my time, just on the preventive side of things and not on the reactive. Anybody else? Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Courtney, you look like you had a... <laughs> you were about to go up there, no? I, I defer to my we were dealing <laughs> competitor yeah, in college, Louis. <laughs> yeah, Louis Martinez with ABC. As you've been going around um, meeting with the forces, um, there's been talk of a divide, you know, the 1% that serve, the, the, the gap and the divide between those that serve and the, the, lar the larger civilian population. Um, have you seen that eroding? Um, is it getting better? Well... The quick answer, no, but I will tell you that, uh, you know, when when we had 150,000 troops in Iraq and 130,000 in Afghanistan, and every day we were engaged in direct combat, and there were American casualties every day, um, and this these wars were on the front page, I mean, that was absolutely the pinnacle of the support from the American people. Now, I mean, we still have troops in Iraq. We still have troops in Afghanistan. We still have troops in Syria, in Somalia, in Yemen, and all of these places that uh, we're still fighting and everything. But it doesn't get as much attention as it did before because the, the strategy we're using to buy with and through our partner forces 
and building capability and capacity in them, um, it, you know, it kind of takes a back seat to what it used to be. Where I do see where we got to continue to educate uh, is with our Guard and Reserve Forces, because more and more we're doing things to, uh, you know, deter long-term power competitors like Russia and China through our exercise programs and, and stuff like that. So you see Guard and Reserve mobilizing not only to do the Iraqs and the Afghanistans, but they're also doing major exercises in the Pacific, in Europe, and things like that. And the feedback I get from some of our guardsmen and reservists is that, hey, you know, employers aren't as uh, sensitive to being in the military as they were in the past when, you know, you were mobilizing guardsmen every day and, you know, we had brigade combat teams locked in, guard brigade combat teams or reserve organizations in combat and everything. So I think there's that general support, and I don't think that's waned. But, again, I think uh, we got to continue to get better in terms of our uh, guardsmen and reservists to, so that the American public understands that we still have people that are out uh, doing the things we need to do. And this total force commitment, active guard and reserve, is how we're going to continue to build this readiness and get after it. Yeah, recently went back and uh, just look at the, the approval, the polls, and uh, the military still has a high trust from the American public. So I'm not sure that uh, there's a divide. I mean, I think that people have opinions and uh, I will challenge where that divide is being defined because our troops certainly don't see it when they come home. Yeah. Our rank and file don't see it when they're serving. As a matter of fact, there's people out there still appreciating everything that they do. So I'll be curious to find out where that, di that divide is. All right. <laughs> All right, Courtney. I do have one quick one. Yeah. So we're about to go into this election year. It's, uh, the election seems like it started 12 years ago already at this point. but. Um, how are you are you concerned that about troops getting pulled into politics are you concerned about you know it, it seems every single <coughs> every so often something comes up where you see a, a often enlisted service member and they're wearing something a hat or something that maybe is inappropriate in uniform are you worried about that get in such a hyper partisan environment increasing uh, sexual no violence? i'm not um First and foremost, and, and you all know this, we remain apolitical in the United States military, and that we are bound to do that. So when anybody is trying to show any kind of political uh, favoritism or anything like that, it's up to us. And certainly what we do as senior enlisted for our commanders and our bosses is to make sure that we reinforce this, okay? And, uh, you know, I had to, I was a post uh, command sergeant major about 11 years ago during an election year and people were putting political posters in their front yards of their government quarters on a military installation so I had to be the bad guy and go and make sure they took them down you know so the, the key thing is we are going to continue to enforce that we remain apolitical and we focus and we focus the men and women on the big picture and that big picture is that two plus three that's outlined in the national defense strategy and that we're prepared to compete, respond, deter, and in the end, fight and win. Yeah, and you're gonna get to see that some of the younger uh, service uh, men and women will probably be a little bit misguided, but it's imperative on us to provide them that guidance. I'll give you an example, and this is a, a few years back, but I pulled up into a military gas station and there was uh, this young A1C, an E3. Uh, filling up his car, and I pulled up right behind him. And in his bumper, there was a bumper sticker that says, don't steal, that's what the government does. Uh, you can imagine how that conversation went. And uh, probably about 15 minutes later, the young man was pulling the sticker, apologizing about it. But his whole point was like, well, I thought it was funny. And then we had to go ahead and had the conversation about, hey, don't forget what you swore to support and defend and what your purpose is in life. And if you don't like that, then we have mechanisms to go ahead and send you to where you can wear any bumper sticker you want, but not in our watch. So um, 
That will do. Every uh, everybody's got an opinion. You see it on social media. You see it on on a lot of different forums. But our duty is to make sure that they're informed on the do's and don'ts of uh, remaining a apolitical. Thanks. That's up. One more. One more. Anybody? This is it. I'm I'm walking away today. And the next time you'll see me, I'll be working on my beard like yours, sir. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> we'll get you both. Yeah. All right. um, so this question, I guess, is going to um, be for CZ then. Uh, obviously, the national defense strategy is everybody's top priority, but for the enlisted troops that you are, you know, here to serve and here to take the temperature on, what is what are you going to be doing about that? What's that going to look like for them? Do you think in the next few years? Well, um, I'm pretty sure that uh, every one of you saw the the chairman's uh, message to the Joint Force Day One, one October. And uh, in there, he's got, uh, he's got five priorities. And I always have them written down, and I have some notes of my initial meeting with, uh, with the chairman. But obviously, the first one is sustaining our values. The second one is improving your joint war fighting readiness. The third one is developing the joint force of the future. Number four is develop and empower joint force leaders. And number five, taking care of our people and families. So you can see how much work needs to be done in every single one of those areas. We're modernizing a lot of our services across, uh, across the board. We're utilizing a lot of uh, inter- and intra-agency mechanisms to be able to affect the mission as we are today. A perfect example of that is uh, Space Command, how they're going to have to go ahead and work uh, continuously with industry in order to maintain that competitive advantage. Um, we recently had the issues with uh, housing. That is just a, a big example on the, the morale, health, and welfare of our force. Uh, we need to pay close attention to that. And uh, I was going to make the comment in the beginning that, you know, how do you follow a guy like this with all the accomplishments that he had over the past four years? And the answer is pretty simple. We can never do enough for our troops compared to what they do for us. So our duty is just to keep on fighting and uh, figuring out exactly what needs to get done, when it needs to get done to make sure that they're taken care of so that they continue to protect us. And I will close uh, with this one particular statement that came out of a helmet sticker that I had on my motorcycle uh, helmet. And it says, <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's a small sticker. But it says, for those who have fought for it, freedom has a taste that the protector will never know. And that is what every single one of those young men and women are doing daily for each and every one of us. So I'll be shame and damn if I don't put every ounce of effort into making sure that I make life better for them. Carla, you get the last one. Thank you. Since I started off with Afghanistan, I'll end on a lighter note. Um, I just want to know from you personally what's been your greatest memory in this position. And I hope I'm not stealing the thunder from your retirement ceremony, but please tell us what's the one thing that stood out more than anything with all of your travels. So uh, there are so many memories, so many good ones here. But I think when what wrapped up uh, for me was just recently I went to Romania. Uh, well, so the chief of defense of Romania sent a letter to the chairman, General Dunford at the time, saying, hey, we want your SEAC to come visit and spend a week with RCX. So General Dunford gave me that letter, so that was kind of <laughs> marching orders that you're going to go over. But uh, I, so uh, my counterpart over there, the SEAC of Romania, Floria Sass, took me to uh, Brashov in the eastern part of the country up in Transylvania. And he, we visited the 21st Mountain Battalion out there, and he said, hey, we're going to take you on a patrol up to the, to the top of this mountain. And so... I mean, I've been patrolling my whole life, you know, and I'm not, you know, averse to doing any of that kind of stuff. But I said, okay. Well, we got up on top of this mountain, and we went to this hero's cross that the <laughs> Romanians put up, just giant cross at the top of this mountain, 7,500 feet in the air. The wind was whipping in my face. The, it was raining, and it was cold. And I had this young PFC Romanian mountain troop that led us up through there, and uh, – as I got up and I saw that cross and everything, it was probably one of the most peaceful moments I've had in the last four years. But more importantly, seeing that hero's cross and then being with this young troop told me that, you know, our line of effort, too, in the NDS, assuring our allies and attracting new partners, but more importantly, the young people that, you know, you heard earlier today that we talked about uh, how important these young people are. 
And last but not least, that that cross shows that uh, the business we're in comes at a cost. And combat is brutal and unforgiving. And, uh, and so we can never forget about those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And I will tell you, finishing off my time by going to Iraq and Afghanistan, coming back, the day after Thanksgiving, and then my last official visit was to Dover Air Force Base. And I visited the Air Force Mortuary Affairs Operation and saw all the great work that that joint team does over there in taking care of those that pay the ultimate sacrifice and the dignified and respectful way that they deliver the remains of loved ones back to their families. And so I think uh, to end that way by seeing our troops that are still in combat, going to the top of that mountain in Romania, uh, and then last but not least, my last trip being at Dover, that those kind of stuck out, stuck out. But for the past four years, I've had so many great memories that it, there's just too many to number. And, uh, you know, uh, building relationships and alliances, and, you know, when we talk about partnering, if it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. So certainly there's been some times that uh, have been challenging, but most there's been times that have been rewarding. And whether that was in the Pacific, in South America, in Africa, in Europe, the Middle East, wherever it was here that we had troops at, those memories will stay with me forever. And it was just, uh, you know, I was humbled that for the last four years I could serve as the SEAC, but more importantly, for almost four decades that I could serve as a member of this warrior class and be teammates with great Americans like CZ Colon Lopez and every other man and woman that serves, has served, or will, can, will serve in the future. So thank you all very much. It's uh, great that you took time out of your busy schedules today. And as I mentioned earlier, it's imperative that we as enlisted have a great relationship with the media because our responsibility is to tell the service member's story and if you ain't hearing it from us, you may hear it from somebody else, and they may not be getting, getting it right. So it's imperative that we have that relationship with you. So being able to spend time with you all, especially some for the last three or four years, uh, has been a treat for me. So thank you all. I appreciate it. And we'll see you all on 13 December, right? Right? Okay. We'll see you all. Thanks. Oh, yes. Cake, coffee, and water, okay?